is basically trying to show how, uh, depending on your convention, you can make the PMOS small signal device look exactly like the NMOS small signal device. And just by a show of hands, who here is comfortable with the NMOS small signal device? Okay. My I'm, I'm glad that most of you are. Um, if you are not, my suggestion is really, really, really familiar familiarize yourself with it. My understanding is that EE-105 um, is supposed to introduce you to that small signal device, at least a low frequency small signal device. So this is all something you should have seen before. But by another show of hands, who here is familiar with the PMOS, comfortable with the PMOS small signal device? Okay, a lot fewer hands and a lot less confidence on your faces. Um, Saurav and I will make sure to emphasize practice problems in section that, that focus more on PMOS devices. So you can sort of see how basically um, it's all the same. A PMOS device is just an NMOS device upside down, or alternatively, stand on your head and look at the circuit and it ends up being the same thing. Um, so we'll focus on that, but hopefully what this last homework set did was give you enough practice problems with both PMOS and NMOS devices that you're starting to feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, so that's one little mini announcement. The other mini announcement is, uh, or there are a couple more. Um, for those of you who don't already know, uh, the official decision on the newsreader for this group, for this class, is using that off news service through Outlook Express, not through Google. So if you post on the Google news groups, um, the TAs may never actually read it because it might never show up on our newsreaders. If any of you are curious as to why that decision was made, you can ask after class, and I'll go into the long and convoluted history. The other announcement is that it is the official policy of this class that homeworks are due at the beginning of class on Wednesdays in the Dropbox in McLaughlin 203. If you have your homework with you right now, that's what I meant. Yeah, not 203. This is 203. Thank you. 240 Corey, the, the, the Dropbox in the second floor Corey student lounge. Um, if you have your homework with you right now, don't run off and drop it off. Do it after class. It's more important that you're here during lecture. Walking up hills is good exercise. Um, because the reader picks it up from there, and it makes coordination a whole lot more difficult. Uh, a, 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 a standardized place, this is the official decision. It might seem as arbitrary and unfair, but the decision is arbitrary. <laughs> yeah? No. Today. In the future, we would like you to hand it in before lecture starts, um, both for basically uniformity and if we say you can hand it in after lecture starts, what I know will happen because I was an undergrad uh, once too. All of you will not be coming to lecture. The la that last hour, you'll be sitting up in the student lounge, either cramming to finish that assignment or checking answers with your friends, and you won't be here. And the point is we want you here. So having the assignments due before lecture means that you're not going to be working on the assignment during lecture. OK? And that is, that is basically non-negotiable. If you have um, an issue that you can't get it in on time, um, occasional exceptions will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, hopefully you'll have a pretty good rationale for that. Anyhow, so that's that's the the administrative material. Um, let's get back to current sources. So on Monday we started talking about current sources, and these are the slides from before. You might recall we want current sources with ideal output resistance, um, but real in reality there's always some finite output resistance, and so the transfer function looks something like this: slide one a. Um, so moving along, so a simple current source which looks like this uh, on slide four, provided that your device M2 is biased such that it's in saturation, in other words, V out is greater than VD sat, or IREF. By and large, this equation holds. Okay, it is not exact. There is a uh, it's 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 um, it's a it's a it's a approximate equality, and that's. Can anyone tell me why these two, why this equation on slide four is not exact? 
Yeah, exactly. Channel length modulation. For the what I had said before, both of these devices have finite output impedances. So as you move V out up and down, I out changes. Clearly, I ref isn't changing. So therefore, I out can't always equal I ref. OK. So the point of slide three was basically that any diode connected transistor is either in cutoff, in which case it's not interesting, or in saturation. Usually whenever you see it on a schematic, it will be in saturation. So you can always plug in the saturation small signal model. And you can go through a calculation of this circuit. to figure out exactly what IREF is based on resistive biasing into your, uh, into your diode connected transistor. So that basically gets us up to speed as to where we left off last time. And so now if we wanted to actually design um, a particular uh, circuit to get a given reference current. So let's say we had, do I, I don't want to keep redrawing it. Um, the picture on the bottom half of slide one, which is a lot neater on your slide than on mine. So if we're trying to design uh, a reference current of 10 microamps, um, this is a basic design problem that you want, that, that, you, that you are looking to solve. And you're looking to solve for our ref, okay? So R ref is basically R ref times I ref is the voltage drop across that resistor. The voltage drop across that resistor is VDD minus VGS1. VGS1, you can plug in the large signal equation, which is basically VGS1 equals VT plus VD sat1. And this expression here, which is all to the power 1 half, is VD sat1. So um, solving for this, uh, uh, solving for R ref in terms of I ref and plugging in your values, you get that R ref ends up being around 415 kilo ohms, um, which you'll you'll see later is a relatively large size for an integrated resistor. Um, resistors typically are so you lay out a resistor. Um, and this is more getting into IC fabrication, by taking a high resistive material, such as polysilicon, and connecting on either end to it with a low resistance material like metal, and then you just have this, this high resistive material, you know, so you get the IR drop. Um, and the resistance of these materials is expressed in terms of ohms per square. in ohms per square. And that's because it's basically, you can sort of see, you can divide these up into squares. And it's, if this is the length of the device, and this is the width, the resistance is proportional. The total resistance of this poly strip is proportional to the length over the width. And the length over the width is a unitless dimension of basically a square. So it's usually around 250 ohms per square, thereabouts. So 415 kilo ohms means you've got a lot of squares, which means it takes up a lot of area. A little aside there. So now we plug in, we, we, we look at the small signal model of this current source, of this current mirror, um, to figure out what the output resistance is on the output device. So if we assume that this is M2, that it's in saturation, we see that the power is now a small AC ground, small signal ground. So uh, what you can see is that this device, this gate node, is connected through a diode connected transistor to ground. So really what this should be is look like this. So this M1 
looks like a diode connected transistor which looks like a resistance and can anyone tell me what the resistance of a diode connected transistor is right 1 over gm 1 over gm1 and in parallel with this rf okay so that that's the first step and to the really draw the yeah use the microphone please for diode connected, is it 1 over GM in parallel with R0? Yeah, it's 1 over GM in parallel with R0. Sorab was saying that we should no longer make the approximation because R0 is not big enough to warrant simplifying just to 1 over GM. Um, Sorab and I will have to talk about that. Most of the time, you can. GM R0 is always going to be greater than 10. Um, so that means that R0 is at least 10 times bigger than 1 over GM. So it's a, it's, it, it might be a 10% approximation error. Um, it really is process dependent. Once you're given the, the quantifiable process numbers, then you can make that evaluation yourself. Okay. But I would say that if, if like GMRO is on the order of 30 or 50, then you're making, then RO is like, 30, that means 30 or 50 times bigger than 1 over GM, so that parallel approximation is something on the order of like a 2 to 3% error. That's fine. Okay. So anyways, so this is, your, this is what your small signal model looks like. Basically, you can see that without drawing the full-blown small signal model, without expanding this out to the transconductance and resistance device, that the gate voltage is not going to move. Um, there's nothing driving the gate voltage and there's no, there's no transmission from the output node to the gate node. So basically you can make this simplification. So, so the gate is at a small signal ground which means that, tra that transconductance device is turned off so the R out of this device is basically of this device on the right is just RO which is 1 over lambda I out. So with an I out we designed I ref to be 10 microamps and I out roughly equals I ref so 10, micro 10 microamps, and if lambda is around 0.1, which is probably a bit optimistic, um, R out is going to be 10, mi 10 mega ohms. And that's far, far larger than, uh, I actually forget about that. So you can, you can get a 10 mega ohm resistor. And yeah, actually, that's far, far larger than that, fourth, that R ref that we used. And that R ref, um, is uh, uh, that our ref, as I said before, takes up a lot of area, whereas a transistor is relatively small. So what you'll see typically in circuits that are fabricated is that when you want to actually have loads, you don't use resistances. You use basically these devices, these current source output devices, as active loads, and we'll get into that later. Okay. And here's just a point, uh, again, with a PMOS device, is that... Uh, an NMOS mirror is a current sink. In other words, it pulls current from the output node in. A PMOS current mirror is a current source. It pushes current out. So depending on whether or not you want current supplied or current pulled, uh, you'd use either a PMOS or an NMOS device. And the other nice thing about this is that you can use these mirrors to turn a current sink into a current source. For instance, you can cascade these things. Let's say, hypothetically, you had this current mirror. This is what you were given. This is a current sink, right? Well, let's say you needed a current source. What do you do? You take that current, and you pull it out of an identical uh, or a similar PMOS current mirror. So here's IREF. This is approximately equal to IREF. So, this is also approximately equal to IREF. By mirroring things up and down, you can turn sources into sinks, depending on what you might need. Okay? So it's a nifty little trick, nothing too complicated, of using current sources to re basically reverse the polarity of a, of a current. current. Using current mirrors to reduce the polar reverse the polarity of a current. Okay. Um, these current mirrors can also be designed in bipolar devices. And it really is basically the same sort of thing. Um, 
Except the one thing we know is that because I collector of a current is equal to I S, which is a process parameter, times EXP of VBE over VT, we've got this sharp exponential. So if the current goes up by 10x, so if I, I see, for IC to go up a whole lot, VBE doesn't go up very much. It goes up a, a much smaller amount. So therefore, typically, for any, any bipolar device that's on, you know that VBE is going to be around 0.6 volts. And that changing VBE by as much as 100 millivolts changes um, I out by a factor of like over 100. That's a factor of 100. So typically, in, in moderate bias points, VBE will be, you can always make the approximation that VBE is going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 700 millivolts, depending on your process. So therefore, you can very easily calculate what I out is going to be. Um, I out is VCC minus VBB, VB on, which is basically the voltage over this resistor, divided by RF. And then the mirror ratio is about 1. There are some other, uh, other mechanisms going on as well that, that, changes, that, that, that changes the mirroring ratio from being exactly 1, but we don't need to get into that. And then uh, another process parameter of bipolar devices is this VA, which is called the early voltage. And the early voltage is basically VA is basically equal to 1 over lambda. Just a different convention for how they, how they specify output resistance. So again, R out is equal to 1 over lambda I out, just like in, in, a bipo in, a, in an NMOS device. Okay? Any questions on this stuff so far? Okay. So <clears throat> let's assume, so, so with this previous device on slide 7, we got an output resistance of 10 mega ohms, assuming that lambda is 0 0.01. Now the question might be asked, well, what if lambda is a lot worse and we still need to get 10 mega ohms? Or what if we need to have an output resistance for one purpose or another that's even higher than 10 mega ohms? Okay? How would you go about doing that? And um, from what you've learned about source degeneration, the answer should already be obvious to you, is that you can basically source degenerate this output node, okay? And do you guys all recall um, what the output resistance for source degenerated what a source degenerated common source stage is. Well, it's given right there, and it's actually just a wee bit wrong. Um, R out is equal to, I'll, I'll draw it, I'll, I'll write it in a different form. Okay, so that's the expression for R out. Um, typically, uh, in, in the notes, a lot of times either RO or, or this, uh, really actually this other RS is left out, and sometimes even this 1 plus chi is left out. Um, that's, that's, strictly speaking, not entirely correct, but R out is going to be a whole lot less than GM times RS R out, as is RS. So these, these, these resistances can basically be ignored. Um, and chi frequently is a pretty small number, like you know, 0.1. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's a small error. But you know, order of magnitude, you're talking about GM RS R out for the output resistance. So given that, if you design it such that GM times RS is much, much greater than 1, then all of a sudden your output resistance goes up. Okay? And that's useful. Flip side to that, however, is that now let's compare to this device, the standard device on slide seven. What is the 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 
the minimum voltage that the output node can be while still supporting um, this high resistance. I heard yeah, all right, VD sat. In order, in order for this device to be high resistance, the output device, it has to stay in saturation. Therefore, V out has to be greater than VD sat. If that condition is not held, then, um, then the high output impedance and the current accuracy of this mirror is no longer maintained. Okay, so V min of this is VD sat. Okay, what can anyone tell me? V min on slide nine. So, does anyone, can anyone tell me what the voltage here is? Right. So, I out, which is basically equal to I ref, times RS. Okay? And what do we know about this transistor here? It has to be in saturation, right? So, what voltage needs to be across that transistor? VD sat. So, this voltage is VD sat plus... I ref times RS, okay? And here's where some little tricks can come in, and I'm not sure what the answer is going to be, but you'll probably get some insight here, is that what is I, I ref is equal to IDS, okay? And how can we relate IDS and VD sat to one another? Okay, well, I'll show you, and then you'll see. Um, so what do we know? We know one of the expressions for GM is 2 IDS over VD sat. Therefore, IDS can be replaced with GM VD sat over 2. Okay, no big tricks there. So therefore, V min is equal to VD sat plus... GM VD sat over 2 times RS. Okay? And the, so V min, I'll rewrite it, is VD sat times 1 plus GM RS over 2. Okay? So this GM RS is the quantity by which this output impedance is increased. Right? Because it goes from basically R out to GM RS R out. So if we call that K, so now R out is equal to K times RO, V min is equal to VD sat times 1 plus K over 2. So you basically see how there's, there's a direct relationship through this K parameter or through the more complicated mathematics that as you increase the R out by source degenerating, uh, you have a resultant increase in V min. So you have an output impedance and swing trade-off because as this voltage gets higher and higher, V min gets higher and higher, it means that the swing that's allowed on this, that node gets lower and lower because the lower bound is increased. Okay. Yeah. Question. Sure. Uh, for the use someone else's mic. For the RS on the other side. Yes. What What does it do? Can we okay. just ignore that? Well, so so. Well, you tell me. Um, there are a couple of things going on. One of which I skipped over. Well, in asking, can you ignore that? Could we, like, remove it? and have this guy connected directly to ground. What do you think? I see a couple shaking heads. That's correct. You can't do that because a key thing here is that you, you need to match the VGSs of these two devices in order for this mirror to be valid. If you get rid of this R and short this node directly out to ground, this device will have a much bigger VGS than this device which means that the current through here will be much, much bigger than the current through here. And so 
you're not getting a current mirror. The relationship between the input current and the output current is violated. Okay? So this is basically done for matching. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is, so, so <clears throat> can we still assume that as we move the, the drain node up and down in order to twiddle the output, to, to verify the output resistance, do we know that the gate node still stays constant? Does it move? Can anyone try to figure that out? Okay, the question is, before on slide 7, a key thing in order to figure out the output resistance was the assumption that even when you twiddle the drain node by inserting either a test voltage or a test current, the gate node doesn't move. If the gate node were to move based on in twiddling the, the drain, then that transconductance device would be activated, and therefore you can't ignore it and come up with a simple R out equals R out. Okay. So now we've got this resistance here. Does that mean that when we twiddle this drain node, that this gate node will now move around? Any guesses? No. Good. Right. Because still, this is still a diode-connected transistor. So it's one, now this resistance here, instead of just being one RF in parallel, RF in parallel with one over GM, is now RF in parallel with one over GM plus RS. But still, there's no mechanism for the drain node to communicate to the gate node. And that's, that's, that's independent. That's basically based on the small signal model, which I'll now draw. So this is the drain, source, drain, gate. Clearly, twiddling the gate node or the source node communicates stuff to the drain node, either through this transconductance device or through this resistor. But you can see that there's no connection from the drain node over here or from the source node to the gate. This gate is basically floating. This is a full-on control node. So therefore, twiddling either of those isn't going to push current or change voltage on the gate node. So there's, there's reverse isolation through your device. Like a, a, a transistor communicates that way, but it does not communicate that way. OK? So, so to answer your other question, the basic analysis with the presence of this RS is still the same in terms of calculating the R out. This node still is a small signal ground. So one cha the changes, however, are that you need this guy in order to maintain the basic symmetry of your mirror. And now VS is not at ground, so uh, VT is going to change, and you'll also have that back body transconductance device activated. But they'll be activated in the same manner, because not only is VGS identical, VGS1 equals VGS2, so if this is M1 and M2, but V SB1 equals VSB2, which is the, the governing mechanism over your back body transconductance. So they affect the devices in the same way. All right? So this is one way to get a higher transconductance, okay? By putting in a, by just basically by source degenerating. Now, let you know, as we said, a four, like putting a putting a mega ohm resistor in polysilicon takes a lot of area. Yeah. I was just wondering. I was just wondering if um, you can use a PMOS to do the same thing, but with an NMOS on the other side. Yeah. Okay, so you're asking whether or not we could do. So having an NMOS as your reference. Whoops, NMOS as your reference. And then having a PMOS device over here, something like this. Yeah. I will leave that as an exercise to the reader, uh, because based on everything you know, you should be able to figure this out relatively easily, and you'll teach yourself something. So, and this this forces you to use the PMOS small signal model. So this is not required work. So if you don't want to do it, don't. But this is good practice. So figure it out. The short answer is no. That this will not work at all. Um, because there's no, there's no 
there's no symmetry, there's no correlation. If the PMO, you know, there's no, there's no, you don't, you, you don't even know, like, on a given chip, PMOSs might be faster than NMOSs, or faster than usual, and NMOSs might be slower than usual, versus vi vice versa. There's no even process matching between these two devices. But you should f try try to figure out um, what, so if this is IREF, this is given, and let's assume WNL and WNL are the same thing, and even if all the process parameters are the same, like KN equals KP, and, all, and VTN equals VTP, blah, 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 figure out what I out as a function of, as it's going to be a function of I ref and V out. Um, ignore gamma, because otherwise you're, well, actually you don't even need to ignore gamma, you can include gamma. You know, figure it out, it'll be good practice, you'll get some insight. Um, this short answer is that this circuit would would very rarely be used, and if it were to be used, it would not be used for a current mirror. It would be used for something else. I wouldn't suggest using this for the design problem. Incidentally, the design problem is being handed out today. It is due in two weeks. Um, it will be posted later tonight, and we will be talking about it a lot in section, both my section on Friday and Saurabh's section on Tuesday. Um, go to section. Design problems are different than analysis. Um, we will be giving very useful advice on how to go through the project. So start thinking about it soon. Start thinking about the project soon, even though you're all a little burned out about homework three. And um, go to section either Friday or Tuesday um, so that you can get a jump on this and, and jump on the design problem. Because uh, you have two weeks to do it, but I anticipate that it will take you longer than homework three. I, exactly how, but you have twice as long to do it. And I don't think it'll be, I don't think it'll be twice as long to solve. It's longer, you have twice as much time. There is not a homework being assigned in addition to it. Um, you know, this class is a bit of trial by fire. We, I've been through this before and I understand like, it's not easy, but getting this stuff down now will be very, very useful. Um, and once you get comfortable with it, the homework problems will get easier. Yeah. Is it individual? Yes. All the, all the information on the design projects uh, are posted on design projects, and I don't want to take time from lecture discussing it now. So if you have questions about the material, feel free to ask it. Otherwise, um, let's stick to this stuff. Okay? Yeah, but we're talking about that later. <laughs> All right. So, the f just so you know, there are three design projects. The first one is going to be individual. Um, subsequent ones will probably be teams of two. But we'll talk about that in section. Anyways, getting back to these current sources and getting a high impedance out of your current source, um, one method as we discussed before, just now, is source degeneration, whoops, source degeneration with just some kind of resistor. Now, we've already learned that a really good resistor is the output resistance of, uh, sat, uh, of a saturated uh, MOS device. So therefore, that kind of motivates the next slide. Rather than putting a resistance down here, you basically put effectively another stage of current mirroring such that This now, this dev this output device now looks like it's being degenerated by R out, and as we know that R out is typically typically much greater than any kind of R S that you can do. So, for this kind of device, um, let's assume that uh, gamma is equal to zero, or that you tied all wells to source, so you don't have to worry about V T shifts. Okay, and let's try to calculate. Well, for, first of all. What's the R out of this device? 
Anyone want to give it a shot? Assuming all devices are in saturation. Well, wait, so GM, GM R out quantity squared or GM times R out squared? That is, ba yeah, yeah, to first order, that is exactly correct. Um, what it actually equals is, remember, so let's call this RS, and from our previous equation, it's R out, which in this case is R out 2, plus RS, which in this case is R out 1, plus GM2, 1 plus chi, R out, which is R out 2, times RS, which is R out 1. Okay? So yeah, by and large, these things can be removed, and you get GM R out times R out, which is basically, again, taking the resistance that's resistance looking down and just multiplying it by GM R out of device 2. Okay? I'll let that sink in for a second. Okay, everyone clear with that? Any questions on, on R out? Okay. Now let's figure out what V min at this output device is. Okay? And it's and, and we'll we'll just basically follow through the progression that's on the slide. The 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 gate the voltage here is V D V T plus V D sat, and then you increase another V T plus V D sat to get to this node. So the voltage here is 2 VT plus VD sat, okay? So, and then you subtract a VGS to get to here, so you're back to a single VT plus VD sat, okay? So VDS1 is equal to VT plus VD sat, which means that M1 is in saturation, And that's, that's, that's a necessary condition. That assumption is held. And then, in order to keep M2 in saturation, VDS of VDS2 has to be greater than VDSAT, which means V drain of 2 has to be equal to VT plus VDSAT plus VDSAT. Okay? So that's V min. All right. So this device gives you much higher, um, much higher output resistance, but uh, the way based on the way it's biased, V min is even higher. It's two VD sats plus this additional VT, but you get a huge gain in output resistance because of it. What's that? Okay. You know what, now might actually be a good time to take a, a three or four minute break. So why don't we do that and uh, come up here with questions. Yeah, I d in my mat here, I'll show you. Yeah, I called it K just to, as a placeholder. What slide number was that on? Okay, I'll find, oh no, right here, right here, right here. So, yeah, so, so this GMRS shows up in two places. It shows up, R out is equal to GM times RS times R out. So that means this, I, I call this, I just called it a K factor just as a placeholder. So this K factor is the R out multiplication factor, GM times R S. See that? So so R out is now equal to K times R out. Okay. But V min is also increased. And you can see that it's the same thing here. It's V D sat times one plus K over two. And actually I'm sorry? Yes. V min is the minimum, yes, like for all these, well, it might be an output node, it's minimum voltage on that node, yeah, but yes, and and the reason why it's, 
that's important is that in order for all these equations to be valid and for the output to be high impedance, you need those devices to be in saturation. Okay? Yeah. So you just you just factor it out to this. Okay? Yep. Okay. Okay, so what we know, and hopefully, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so this is, both of these are small signal grounds, this device is in saturation. Do you know what the output resistance is here? Okay, solve this. Like this, is, this, 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 this formalism is very important to really understand. So go to your small signal model. I don't have time to wor walk you through it. No. Okay, it's very important. It's like stuff like this is very important that you that you get a handle on. Um, and and so R out is equal to R O of this device plus R S plus G M R out one plus chi. RS. Okay? So that's the full expression. This is bigger than this. Okay, so we'll ignore these. And let's just get rid of 1 plus chi. Okay, let's assume that maybe, you know, like chi is small, so, and just to keep things simple. So GM R out times RS. Okay? Now, we know that, so now let's look at this device. What we have is And we're worried about R out. Do we know what, what's the resistance looking down here? No, this is, it's not a diode connected transistor. This device is in saturation. What's that? R0, right. So now, this can be replaced with R0. And then you plug in that thing, and you get GM times R out squared. See, once you understand this, and you can make the transformation of this to this, the answer is trivial. Okay? Which is why it's really, really important for you to un not only remember this, the answer for this, but also to understand where it comes from, so that in case you forget it, which will happen, you, can, you, can, you know how to use first principles to get it. And how I would do that is by... you know, plugging in the small signal model and solving for it. Okay, and before you have the intuition, you have to do the brute force. Okay? So, yeah, this is common source with degeneration. Um, the important thing is, rather than saying, oh, this is common source with degeneration, Therefore, this is my output resistance. Solve it until you're like, oh, yeah, I recognize this all the time. It's easy. Okay? Sure. Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, don't worry about it. This? Okay. All right. All right. Let's start up again. So I'll 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 do it. All right. So um, before cruising along, uh, just to explain real quick what. So 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 the second thing that I was trying to do here was calculate what the minimum voltage allowable on this drain node to keep all the stuff high impedance. So, so logical step number one is to keep all this stuff high impedance, all devices need to be in saturation. So what you're calculating is what the voltage is here to keep all these devices in saturation. Okay? So the voltage at this gate node, the shared gate node, is VT plus VD sat. There's another VGS increase here, so this voltage 
is 2 times Vt plus Vd sat. They're two VGSs. Going down to here, since all these devices are identical, you lose a VG, VGS, so this voltage here is Vt plus Vd sat. Now, so therefore we're like, okay, is this device here in saturation? Yes, it is. Vt plus Vd sat is greater than Vd sat. Therefore, M1 is in saturation. Now, therefore, what voltage across M2 do we need to keep it in saturation? We need another Vd sat. So therefore, V min is Vt plus Vd sat plus Vd sat, which is Vt plus 2 Vd sat. Okay? Because you don't. I just walked through it. I mean, because you only need this. Uh, do, do, do you agree with me that the, that the source node of M2, this voltage is at Vt plus Vd sat? Okay. How much voltage across the drain source of M2 do we need to keep it in saturation? Okay. So, here, this is basically walking through... Um, the IDS versus V out of this previous device. So, <coughs> in order for M1 to be in saturation, the voltage at the drain of M1 must be greater than VT, VD sat. And we also know that the voltage at the drain of M1 is lower than the voltage at the drain of M2 because there's going to be current flow this way. Therefore, there has to be some voltage drop. So, if, uh, if V out is less than VD sat, both M1 and M2 are in linear. Okay? Because there, there just isn't enough voltage to, to support a VD sat across either of them. So it looks like a resistor. I, IDS versus V out. Once M1, once this voltage is larger than VD sat, and it's actually a little bit more than VD sat, it's somewhere out over here, M1 is then in saturation. And until you get up to this point, um, M1 is in saturation, M2 is in linear, so you kind of get a current relationship that looks like this. And then finally, once both devices are in saturation, you hit your high impedance point, which is represented by a flat line on the IDS versus V out curve. Yes? Um, isn't, is V out a controlling variable? Like, do you get to control that, actually? It depends on the exact scenario, but um, for the sake of this analysis, yes. A lot of times there will be something else that kind of sets V out, um, and you need to make sure that whatever sets V out is such that all your assumptions are held. Like that, that's the, the basic premise of this course is that you make assumptions about the operating condition, and then at the end you kind of have to go back and make sure that the circuit is set up such that all your assumptions are correct. And actually with regards to homework, it's very important that you do that. Um, for, uh, we, will, we will dock a point or two if you make assumptions about, or at least for the time being, if you make assumptions about devices, certain devices being in saturation, and then you don't go back and double check that. For instance, the book from Rizavi, the question from Rizavi out of problem one, excuse me, the question from Rizavi in problem set two had the devices going from saturation to triode to cut off and, and back and forth. And if you just made the assumption that the devices were always in saturation, you'd, you'd get a lot of those problems wrong. Um, this is from problem set two, not from the most recent problem set. So it's important to, to verify your assumptions about this stuff, at least until you get comfortable enough with your topologies to sort of intuitively know that the devices are going to be in saturation. Okay. So, um, are out for a current source, a cascoded current source. We already calculated, and it's basically what we had said before. Um, and then you can go in and make the the plug-in things, uh, plug-in things for um, R out. You know, R out equals one over lambda ID sat. Plug-in values for GM, and so on and so forth. And you can do the turn the crank to get that expression. So basically, you can relate R out in terms of the VD sat that you choose, as well as the I out that you choose. Okay? And actually, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, and whenever you're presented an equation like this, or at least something that I do, 
is in order to sanity check it, and you should also do this on the homework, make sure the units work out. Okay? Because if the units don't work out, if, if the right side of the equation were in units of uh, current, then you'd know you have a problem in your equation. So this is units of voltage, this is units of current. Lambda is 1 over units of voltage, so it's 1 over V squared. Um, chi is unitless, so you get 1 over I over V, which is V over I, which is resistance. So, so a quick sanity check to make sure that the, the math, is, math is right. Okay? Slide 13. You can triple cast code. Um, nothing particularly interesting about this. You can quadruple cast code. You can quintuple cast code. Realistically, uh, with modern devices, 0.13 micron, VT is on the order of 300 millivolts. Uh, your power supply is on the order of 1.2 volts. So each VGS is going to be greater than 300 millivolts. Therefore, you have limited, you have limited room in the amount that you can, you can cast code. And, and obviously, this guy here has a very reduced swing because of the biasing and the fact that you need, obviously you need at least three VD sats and actually due to the biasing, V min here, unless I've got it wrong, is going to be 2 VT plus 3 VD sat, which is pretty big. Um, it means very small swing. Uh, and you can, you can convince yourself of that by using the same process that I used. Uh, in the earlier slide. Okay? So, going back to the just the cascoded source as opposed to the triple cascoded source, um, we had said, we had calculated before that Vmin is equal to Vt plus 2 Vd sat. Okay? And that reduces, you, you want Vmin to be as low as possible. Okay? And the reason why uh, it's VT plus 2 VD sat is because this voltage here in slide 10, in slide 10, this voltage is VT plus VD sat. Now that's not necessary. The minimum voltage to keep this guy happy is only VD sat. Okay? So therefore, if you can come up with a biasing scheme that puts VD sat on this node, then V min becomes two VD sat, a VD sat here and a VD sat here, and you're done. Okay? Um, and one conceptual way to do that is to apply a battery here. So this is, right here is two VT plus VD sat. If you apply a battery voltage here, this is VT plus two VD sat. It would be easier if I redrew this on a separate page. Are my diagrams getting too cluttered? Okay, no one's saying yes, so I'll assume it's fine. Um, the problem here is that I will be writing things quickly, so things will be messy, but I'm sure you can figure out what's going on. So basically, really what you want to do, so let's break this connection here. You want, the vol you want the voltage here to be VD sat. So you want the voltage here to be VT plus 2 VD sat, right? Because if the voltage here is VT plus 2 VD sat, the voltage here will be VD sat. So you need to figure out a way to do that. And then by doing that, you get, a mu you get higher swing on this cascode output node, OK? So let's skip over slide 15. So slide 16 shows a possible way to, uh, to, to generate VT plus VD sat on this node. OK? So everything is equally sized, except this device is one quarter the size. OK? So at this node, you have. Vt plus 2, plus, excuse me, plus Vd sat. And because the, uh, this device is quarter sized, Vd sat is proportional for the similar current, is proportional to 1 over the square root of W over L. 
So that means the VD sat of M2 is two times the VD sat of M1. So this voltage here, you add another VT, you add a VT and two VD sat to get up here. So the voltage up here is two VT plus VD sat plus three VD sat, and then by going down on this bridge with a standard, all these things are biased up to have the same current. You lose a VT and a VD sat, which gets this node here to be VT plus two VD sat as it says here. Therefore, when you drop another VGS, this node here is going to be at a VD sat, and uh, therefore V min is equal to basically the, the, let's call this node X, VX plus VD sat, which is equal to two VD sat. So this is one of several different techniques that one can use to create a high swing cascode. The key thing to keep in mind is that what you need to do is on this, on the gate node, so on the gate node, well the key point is that you want to put a voltage of VD sat there, which means that on this node, this is your output lag, you want basically VT plus 2 VD sat. Whatever scheme you can come up with to do this, you know, more power to you. Um, here is one. I know Gray and Meyer has some other approaches. Um, I haven't looked at the Rezabi book, but there are probably some other approaches there. Um, you know, you can use what you'd like, uh, but this is a way to get a high swing cascode current source. All right? Yeah? Okay. VD sat. Yeah, I'm not. I'm still getting used to teaching in this room, teaching with an overhead camera. So the voltage, the voltage at the gate here, you want to be VT plus two VD sat. So the voltage here, all the notes, I think, I, I think the the stuff that that are already on the slide is consistent. It's good enough. So the voltage here, you want to be VT two VT plus three VD sat. And you accomplish that by having a quarter sized device running the same amount of current. So the point is that VD sat 2 equals 2 VD sat 1 equals 2 VD sat. That's, that's the point here by using this quarter sized device. Okay? So slide 17, slide 17 is basically showing how, or talking, so, so if we wanted a milliamp here out of our, out of our output device, um, we could very easily set M1 equal to M2 and design IREF to be one milliamp, right? Choose RF to, to, to design our IREF. However, um, and that's sort of option A. However, what if we, you know, the power that's burning in this ha the left half of the circuit is wasted. It's basically power that's used to establish this bias voltage, but isn't actually doing anything useful like creating a higher GM to get a higher gain um, or a lower output resistance or anything like that. There's nothing saying that we can't make this guy basically 10x smaller, make RF, 10x larger, and hence IREF will go down 10x, but VGS, and when I say 10x smaller, I mean 0.1W over the same L, okay? VGS will still say, stay the same voltage because VD sat is equal to square root of 2ID over K prime W over L. ID is going down by 10, as is W, so the VD sat doesn't change. And so basically the power consumed in this wasted bias leg uh, is reduced by 10x. But what, ends up, what that ends up meaning is that M2 has to be 10 times, 10 times larger than M1. And if M1 ends up being a fixed size, then M2, then, then you either have to make M the M2 device bigger, 
or you're making M1 smaller, but you're making RF bigger. And by making RF bigger, that consumes more area. So you end up you end up consuming less power, but typically you'll have some hit in terms of the area of your circuit. Okay, and this is this is this is useful to keep in mind because the um, design criterion for design problem one that you'll see later today is you need to meet a certain set of specifications while minimizing the power times area product. And as something that should come as no surprise to any of you is that you can't get anything for free. So if you look to really, really minimize power by doing a trick like this, chances are that it'll, it'll increase area. So design problems tend to be about meeting a sweet spot while also meeting a, optimizing one criterion while meeting a set of constraints or specifications. So um, it, it comes down to kind of finding the sweet spot. OK? How am I doing? All right. So there's another current source, a high impedance current source. So hopefully I've motivated to you that high impedance current sources are useful, and we like them. Um, so so uh, wh I've already shown you one topology uh, using ca cast coding. Another topology is what's called the Wil Wilson current source, named after the guy who invented it, Wilson. And it looks like this. Um, so if we assume that I out e if we assume that gamma is equal to zero, just to, again to keep things simple for first order, um, we can see that because of this mirror, whatever ends up happening if all these devices are in saturation, I M two equals I M three, which means that I out equals I ref, and uh, you can also see that so the voltage here is V T plus V D sat. The voltage here is 2VT plus 2VD sat. So the voltage at the gate of at the drain of M3 is not equal to the voltage at the drain of M2, which means that the currents won't be exactly equal. But as we'll see, and we'll get into that a little later. But let's try to let's try to calculate what the output resistance of this topology is, okay? And if you look at this, you might say, oh, well, look, this looks pretty easy. You've got this device degenerated by, and don't copy this down too, too literally, because I'm going to show you that you're wrong, or show you that this and that I'm wrong, excuse me. It kind of looks like that. So we know from our previous analysis that R out would be equal to RO plus 1 over GM plus GM RO times 1 over GM roughly equals 2R out. Not true, because there's some weird mechanisms going on. There's this feedback through this loop. Okay, So you'll learn later in the semester how to analyze the circuit using feedback to get the solution for R out quickly, but for the time being we have to do the small signal analysis and brute force it through. So. Let's look at <coughs> let's look at slide 19 while keeping slide 18 in mind. Okay, and I'll redraw slide 18. And this is our circuit M3, M1, M2. So what becomes very very important? a skill that you should hopefully develop by now, and if not, really work on it, is translating this, the circuit diagram, into a small sigma model. Okay? Hopefully you all feel very comfortable with doing that. If not, um, practice. So and since we're doing R out, we're going to put in this test current, IT. Okay? And so let's just sort of look through <coughs> to see what's going on, to see how, how this small circuit was made, small signal circuit was made. Let's start with M3. So let's call this node, let's call this node Vx. So here is node Vx. And the drain of M3 is connected to Vx, so you've got RO3 and GM3 VGS2 here. Okay? And this is also, Vx is also the source of M1. 
Okay? Now let's look at M2. M2 is a diode connected transistor, so we can replace it with one a resistance 1 over GM2 from ground to the source of M1. Excuse me, this is supposed to say gate of M1. And this is the source of M1. Okay? And the voltage across this resistance is VGS2 because it's that. And so that's why this is here. Okay? Now, let's draw an M1. This is VGS1 because it's a vol it, we've already defined this is a gate node, this is a source node. Connected from the drain to the source are these two devices. And then you've got your test current attached here. So hopefully this is all review. Um, if not, if, if you're confused by this, you've really got to sit down and understand how to get to this. Like, that's really important. So anyways, so all the devices are biased up roughly equally, so all the GMs are equal. And then you can start going through the small signal mathematics. Okay, so I'll, I'll walk you through this. Um, VT, okay, we need to calculate what VT is in terms of IT. So by KCL, we know that the current, how did he do this? The current flowing through there, so the I through R01 is equal to <coughs> IT minus GM VGS1, because current is flowing in and current is being sucked out by this. So the way this equation got, got came together is really that VT, VT is equal to the voltage across R01 plus the voltage plus VGS2, okay? And vol the voltage across R01 is IR01, which I have here by KCL, times R01, and the voltage across VGS2 is the current through VGS, through this resistor, which is equal to IT, because any current that flows in here splits out among these two branches, but comes back together here. So this is equal to IT, the current through here. So it's basically IT over GM2. So if you expand out IR01 like so, you get this expression. And the approximation that was made is that IT times RO, which is this term here, is much, much bigger than IT over GM2. So actually that whole thing is crossed out. Now VGS1 is equal to, is equal to VG minus VS. VG is basically uh, the current that's through R3 times R3, and the current that's through R3 uh, is equal to GM3 VGS2, and GM3, GM times VGS2 is equal to, um, we, know that VG, we know that VGS2 is equal to IT over GM. So, so IRO3 is equal to GM VGS2 is equal to IT. Okay? So you plug through, you end up plugging through all this, you again make the approximation that 1 over GM is much, much less than RO3, so you ignore that, and you solve these two equations together, and you get that expression. So basically, <coughs> you end up getting uh, R out is equal to R out 1 times 1 plus GM3, GM times R out 3. So let's look back at these devices. It's R out 1 times 1 plus the gain of that device. So it ends up being something entirely different from what you'd sort of expect by naive analysis, and that's because of the feedback loop. I do realize I sort of rushed through the mathematics and skipped a couple of steps. Um, I'd suggest that if I'd suggest that you work through this to see, to get this result yourself. Again, good practice. And if you're really diligent, convert it into PMOS and do it for PMOS and make sure you get basically the same result. 
and that's good practice. Yeah. Sorry, did you say that the current through RO3 is GM3 VGS2? Yes, I did, and it has to be because by KCL, it's actually minus. So if you define current as this way, so the current that goes through this way, the only way it can be supplied is by that transconductor. So, so if, if that's IRO3, it has to equal minus GM3 VGS2 just by inspection of this topology. There's no other place the, circuit, the current could come from. Okay, slide 21, um, I guess this is just to, to, to figure out what VO min is. And we know here, we know that, um, you know, I'm not actually entirely certain what slide 21 is for, so let's skip it. There isn't, there isn't really anything of particular relevance on slide 21. So here on slide 22, uh, as I said before, <coughs> we basically have to apply small signal analysis. Um, it's not correct to make that simplification that I did before and assume that R out is basically a common source with degeneration. Um, so this is, this is the erroneous calculation that I had done before, just sort of repeated uh, for, for the reasons that I went through, basically because of this tight feedback loop. Um, uh, that analysis is incorrect. And the basic reason why that analysis is incorrect is that that analysis depends on the fact that this is device M1 in the Wilson current source. It depends on the fact that the gate of M1 is attached to a small signal ground. If you look at this topology, you can see that that's not the case. This gate is tied to the drain of M3 and this output current source. So we don't know precisely if this voltage is going to move as you twiddle this gate, this drain up and down, the drain at the output. So you kind of have to assume that it might move and recalculate things. And as it turns out, when you plug in the math, um, there is a tight feedback loop that forces this, this drain, this gate moves as you move this drain voltage. And that's the basic reason why um, that's the feedback that's giving you the higher output resistance. Okay. So, um, slides 23 and 24 uh, are basically the small signal analysis repeated. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to get this far, so I haven't looked too carefully at these slides. But it's basically the small signal analysis repeated. Um, Yeah, you can go through this again if you'd like. Okay. Oh, so <clears throat> so let's look at this again large signal. And what we had sort of assumed was that I out is equal to I ref in our analysis. And not only is that an assumption that we that we make to make our analysis simpler, but it's also something we want. If we have a reference current we want the output current. Whenever you mirror it, you want it to be an accurate mirror. You want it to be as precise as possible. Now, in reality, so now we, we put on our large signal hats, and we realize that in order for, for IM3 to equal IM2, there are two conditions. VGS2 equals VGS3. That condition is met, OK? But also, VDS2 must equal VDS3. That condition is not met. We calculated before that this voltage is VT plus VDSAT. This voltage here is 2VT plus 2VDSAT. So therefore, there's a larger VDS across M3 than M2, which means that more current will flow in M3 than in M2, which then results in the fact that I out won't be as big as I ref. You'll have some loss in this mirror. 
Okay, is everyone clear on the logical reasoning behind that? Yeah? Okay. So, so VDS3 So, so in order for the currents to be equal, the VGSs have to be equal and the VDSs have to be equal. Goes without saying, large signal equation, the current in saturation is based on VGS and VDS. If those two conditions are guaranteed, then the currents are the current equality is guaranteed. So we can tell just by looking at the circuit that the VGSs are in fact equal of M2 and M3. The VDSs, however, let's calculate what the VDSs are. So VDS2 is the voltage from here to here which is equal to VT plus VDSat. Okay? VDS3 is the voltage from here to here. So we know that VGS1 is another VT and another VDSat, so the voltage at this node, at this node here, is 2VT plus 2VDSat, which means that that's what VDS is of the M3. So So basically, we can see that VDS is actually greater, VDS3 is greater than VDS2, which along with VGS2 equaling VGS3 implies that I3 is greater than I2. And that's because of the um, square law saturation current model, which is 1 half K W over L VGS minus VT squared times 1 plus lambda VDS. The two, if the two VGSs are equal, but the VD, VDSs are not, the one with the larger VDS will have the larger current. Okay. So slide 25 shows you a way <coughs> to solve this matching problem. And it's basically by putting this extra device here. You gain a VGS, a VT plus VDSat here, and you put this diode connected transistor to level shift it back down. So now the VDS, VDS3 equals VDS2, as well as VGS2 equals VGS3. Ergo, by, con by exact construction, I0 equals IRF. Okay. Yes? Isn't that just the same as your CAS code basically now? It's basically, it's, it, this, this is now very similar to the CAS code, but the difference is where this, so, so, so look at slide 25 and you can see that the diode connected things are here and here. With a CAS code, both diode connections are on the left side. The difference ends up being a lot and nothing in that it, there's no big difference in that V min ends up being the same for these two. Okay? The difference is a lot in that the basic principle of operation, totally different. This is using feedback. This is using this, this feedback around this loop. This is the, to get high output impedance. This is using source degeneration, which in and of itself is a source of feedback, is a type of feedback, and you'll learn more about that later, but different modes of operation. Um, the other big difference is that the nature of this device, as far as I know, this Wilson current source, you can't level shift you can't put your battery in here to get um, to get this node here just to be VD sat to get the high swing right with the current source with using the methods I went through you can all right well I mean you don't have batteries at your disposal I, I'm not giving you a battery and you're not going to put a battery in here. There might be a topology that you can do to shift it around. And again, that would be an interesting exercise for the reader. 
I didn't give you an actual battery. I said, this is kind of what we want to do. We want to get the effect of having a VT shift in voltage. But you can't do it with a battery. I did it with transistors. You don't have, there's no such thing as an integrated battery. Yeah. So why would you want to use a Wilson? What? So why would you want to use a Wilson instead? That's a good question. Um, I haven't seen it used all that much. Uh, it's just, I mean, these, there's, there's some basic principles here that are worthwhile learning. So, okay, so I didn't get, so didn't finish this up. Uh, Bob will finish up current sources on Monday. Um, the, so before you guys go, a couple of general announcements. Um, make sure that you hand in the problem set three that is due today soon. Uh, basically now. Go there now. Make sure the design project will be posted in a, can you guys just keep it down for just a second? Design project will be posted later this afternoon um, and be sure to go to section uh, because we'll be talking a lot about the design project and I know you're all a little burned out from homework three. Take a little bit of a break uh, but try to start thinking about the design project before the weekend if you can because you'll be better off that way.